In this story, we travel back 900 years to explore the origins of the word assassin. In 1960, Mike and Richard set out on a journey to explore the Valley of the Assassins in northern Persia. This year, we are revisiting this story which ties together Islam, the Crusades and the Assassins. It was in these mountains in northern Persia, here in the Valleys of the Assassin, that Hassan i Sabah ruled a fanatical Muslim community. Remote, wild and rugged country, cut off from the outside world and rarely visited before by Europeans. Michael Oliver and I went to Iran in 1960 to explore the Valley of the Assassins here in the Alamut Valley. The original headquarters and home of the Ismailis, a radical Shiite Islamic sect. We were part of a university expedition. This is Michael. And this is me. This is the film we made. We were 19 years old as we set off on this journey to explore the castles of the assassins. And we had no idea of what we were getting ourselves into. And that valley, uh, we found various tombs, which were very ancient. Um, the Valley of Ashkabar is always etched in my mind. And I said to them, had they ever seen Europeans before? And they said, yes, they had. Some Russians after the Second World War came through. And I said, oh, where did they go? And they said, uh, we didn't like them. Uh, we killed them. I said, and there was a pause, with axes. So we, we got the message that these were people not to be trifled with. Whether a paradise existed or not, the assassins horrified and struck terror into the hearts of Western Europeans. And if one is left, is good enough to kill you. And you never know who he is and when he will reach you. So they were the first inventors of political assassination. The actual name assassin, though, um, comes from the word hashish. And this was because it was believed. They thought that if you carry out your orders and are killed in the process, because of course most of them were, wow. you would, this would be your reward in heaven, you'd be a martyr and you'd go to heaven. The legend goes like this. Hassan had a few chosen followers that he had drugged during their meal. They were then carried down a secret passage to this garden, which was full of virgins and damsels and anything they wanted. And when they came round, they were very confused and they were encouraged to believe that they had indeed been in paradise. To discover the ancient truths hidden in this valley, we had come well prepared. Our objective was to make a scientific investigation and to survey and photograph the major assassin castles. This is Peter Willey, the leader of our expedition. Peter was meticulous in everything he did. This is Roddy Dugmore, our surveyor, who made precise drawings of all the castles. This is Ragnar van Leyden, our main photographer. We also brought two doctors with us, both of them Iranians, who held morning surgeries in each village we came to. And this is Michael Oliver. Michael was by far the best climber we had. He was also our quartermaster in charge of all our food and stores. It was important to have the doctors because we thought, and it proved to be correct, that when we got into these very remote areas in northern Iran, they had very little access to medical help. And so we got a lot of help and a lot of advice from the locals. It was extremely helpful. Uh, both of them were Iranian speakers. Uh, Farsi speakers, so that it was, we were welcomed rather than being looked at with concern, you know. We were following in the footsteps of Freya Stark, the great English traveller. So we knew that Hassan Isaba, the founder of the Ismailis here in Iran, 
had built impregnable fortresses through these mountains to protect himself and his followers from the Seljuk Turks, who had overrun the Middle East at this time. But it wasn't only the Seljuk Turks. It was also the Orthodox Sunnis who wanted to eliminate this secretive Islamic sect. They portrayed Ismailism as an arch, as an arch heresy within Islam, which aimed to destroy Islam from within. My reading has it that when Muhammad died, there was a huge split in the Muslim world. I'm going to find Charles Melville, who's an expert on this subject. In 632, Muhammad died. So what happened then? Well, this created a great crisis in the early Muslim community because there was no provision for his succession. And so there were two groups. The main group, the Sunnis, and they believed in the most fit person was a senior member of the community, someone who had been a, a very early convert to Islam, was a respected elder citizen, elder statesman. And the other group, who are the Shiites, the Shi'is, they believed it should have been Ali because he was the closest relative of Muhammad and that somehow Muhammad's prophetic and spiritual powers and grace, you could say, had really come through into Ali and therefore his line. And the Ismailis are Shi'is. I mean, they're just one of the groups who trace their, um, their ideas about spiritual descent. We set off with our mule trains that took us over the 8,000-foot-high mountain passes. As the clouds cleared, the great rock of Alamut, one of Hassan's main strongholds, appeared in front of us. <laughs> 